Okay. Uh, it's my pleasure to be here and to talk with you uh, about agricultural policy. Uh, my guess is that many of you are kind of frustrated with government right now. Uh, on the other hand, I actually find it extremely exhilarating uh, and interesting, and I would only note that our founding fathers are actually probably smiling at this because they set up this process of government to slow legislation down. They were really, really worried about the rush to legislate and pass laws, uh, and they wanted to make it only happen when we were in agreement that it should happen, and not just happen because a majority wanted it to happen. So uh, a little bit different take than probably what the talking heads are telling you on the news channels, et cetera. Um, what I want to do is, is talk to you about where foreign policy is. I want, I'm not going to talk about specifics because I'm not sure where the specifics are going to be. Um, I will try to draw you into sort of an understanding of the process because I think we're in process right now more than anything else. Uh, some ideas of where, what issues are coming down the road and then ending with a discussion of what's happening to the safety net and the implications, I think, to you as lenders. And this trans or segues into Matt's presentation, uh, I think, pretty nicely. This is the fourth time we've done this. Uh, and so I, Matt and I have worked pretty hard at trying to make them uh, sequence one another and speak to sort of the same topics. And hopefully, we will, we will do that. Uh, we are now in conference in terms of policy process. When you hear the word conference, what that means is both the Senate and the House have passed bills. The bills differ, uh, at least in one place. Uh, and therefore, a conference committee is appointed. The conference committee is, opposed, is, a, is composed of the leading members of the Senate and the House on that particular issue. In this case, it would be the Farm Bill. Uh, there are lots of myths about conference, OK? And I will try to mis dispel some of them in my discussion. The, the biggest myth is that the conferees can only negotiate within the existing bills. OK? They cannot go outside. If it's not in the House bill or not in the Senate bill, they cannot go outside. The role of the conferees is to get a bill passed by both houses. They can literally rewrite the legislation if they want to. Now, Let's be honest, the odds of that happening is pretty slim because it's been debated on the floor and this is what has passed the floor. But don't ever think they can't rewrite sections and bring things into the discussion that was never part of the discussion to begin with. Their job is to get a bill passed. Okay? The other thing is, unlike most committees, the House and the Senate remain, conferees remain separate bodies. Okay? And this becomes critical, and I'll come back and explain why this is critical in this particular process. And what I mean by that is when they, if and when they get to a final bill, uh, the Senate conferees must, by majority vote, accept the conference report. And the House conferees, by majority vote, must accept the conference report. So if either the House conferees or the Senate conferees do not accept the bill, the bill dies in conference. Okay? They do not vote as an entire committee. Okay? They vote as, as bodies in the committee itself. Okay? And this becomes really critical in this process. Okay? There are some other things I'll dispel as we go along. Uh, obviously, what you do is you look for differences in the bills when you go into conference. Uh, if you ever hear the word rack, this is what they're referring to. Okay? They do a rack up of the bills, which means they're doing similarities. If you take these bills and you lay them down and you read them, okay, not that I've read them, but I have perused each of the bills. The Senate bill is, uh, is 1,062 pages. Okay? Uh, the thing that would strike you is the similarity of these bills. Okay? I don't know what their magic number is, but there's probably 90% agreement in these bills. Okay? And so your initial thought would be, this is going to be pretty easy to conference as conferences go. Not that it would be easy, but it's going to be pretty easy because there's relatively few issues. The story that I'm going to leave with you, however, is the differences are differences in big capital letters. Okay? Because most of the differences are philosophical differences. Okay? Now what I mean by that is, 
if, if you take, let's say, target prices, something that you're familiar with, and the Senate has a target price of $4 in it, and the House has a target price of $4.50, okay, and you come to conference, you sit there, you make all your speeches, and then what do you do? You split it, okay? If the Senate wants to spend a billion dollars on something and the House wants to spend a half a billion dollars on something, okay, you make your speeches, you do all the stuff, and then what do you do? You split, you split the difference, okay? Unless somebody really wants to argue, okay? Because you can't get hang, hung up on numbers, but rarely numbers. The problem is the differences in the House and the Senate bill on many different aspects that they differ on, not in the bill's totality, but what they differ on are philosophical differences. And in the philosophical differences, you either win or you lose, okay? Or else you're gonna be very creative in the way you create a compromise, okay? And so somebody's gonna win, somebody's gonna lose over these issues, okay? And that makes it much harder to compromise. And as I go through this, hopefully you'll get a feel for what I'm talking about in specific issues. The most talked about difference in the, in the farm bills for obvious reason, particularly given the way the, South, the House came to its farm bill is nutrition <coughs> programs. There are huge differences in, in the cuts, okay? Please be aware that every budget number that I use with you is 10 years of cuts. So it's cuts over 10 years. It's not per year, okay? The first thing, if anybody tells you a number of budget cuts, is don't believe them, ask them how long it is. I'm being serious, okay? We talk about one year of cuts, five years of cuts, and 10 years of cuts. And you can get very different impressions if you think a 10-year cut is a one-year cut, okay? So, so when so, if somebody throws a budget number at you when it comes to legislation, ask them over what period of time that is. I'm using 10 years because that's the way we're thinking about scoring this bill over 10 years, okay? Uh, nutrition programs, the House, the Senate, excuse me, uh, cuts about $4 billion over 10 years, okay? Um, that is out of a program that is scored at approximately $790 billion over 10 years, okay? Roughly 79% of the farm bill is spent on nutrition programs, okay? The House, on the other hand, wants to cut $40 billion over 10 years, or 10 times the amount of the Senate, okay? Now, how the House makes those cuts is it reduces the number of enrollees number of eligible people eligible for nutrition programs. And this becomes the critical question. Given the current state of the U.S. economy, should we be cutting eligibility for food stamps? Okay? This is not about a budget number. The budget number simply reflects a difference in philosophy. The philosophy of the Senate is this is not a time to be cutting eligibility. The philosophy of the House, i.e. particularly the Republican membership in the House, is that this is a time we should be cutting eligibility. How the House cuts eligibility is it changes the eligibility criteria in several different ways, including eliminating the option that states have to revoke the right to, to revoke that you must work in order to receive nutrition programs. Okay. The, other, the last point that I want to make on nutrition is that in the 2008 Farm Bill, and I, I think this is a bigger fight than just $4 billion versus $40 billion, eligibility versus non-eligibility or cutting eligibility for the programs. Okay, in the 2008 Farm Bill, the, the, the conferees, the bill itself, uh, changed the name of the food stamp program to the Supplemental Nutrition Assistance Program, or SNAP. In legislation, names matter because names signal intent. The 2008 Farm Bill signaled the intent of Congress to move nutrition programs from calories to nutrition. Now, I don't know how many of you have ever actually done the experiment of trying to eat healthy versus just what you eat, okay? But it is a lot more expensive to eat healthy than to just consume calories. So, while this is not a big player in this particular farm bill, we are setting up a major debate about the cost of nutrition programs when the object is to pursue nutrition as opposed to calories. And that sets in the background of this debate, okay? So, 
Nutrition's a big difference. And I will come back and talk about how this plays into where we go from here, but let me go through some of the other differences in the Farm Bill, okay? One of the big differences, and, and one that I think is humongous in its significance if it comes into being, and I don't honestly think it will come into being, is that the Senate takes the traditional approach about how we do farm policy. And what we have done ever since 1949 is that we amend permanent legislation. And the permanent legislation in farm bills is the 1938 Act and the 1949 Act, okay? And then on top of that, we do it as an amendment. The other thing that we do is that we amend for only so many years. And one of the urban myths is that farm bills are always five years. Just tell people that's bunk. We've done three-year farm bills, four-year farm bills, five-year farm bills, six-year farm bills, and seven-year farm bills. Okay? It is as long as Congress wants to make it. Okay? But the key thing is there are amendments. And you know after X number of years you're going to come back and re-debate. And this is with respect to Title I. I'm talking about Title I for commodity programs here. What the House does is a very radically different approach. It strikes permanent law, okay? Revokes the 48 Act, the, 40, the 49 Act, and the 38 Act, and substitutes its provisions. And there is no timeline in the House. What that means is we will talk about Title I when we decide we're going to talk about Title I. And that might be 50 years from now. Okay? Process-wise, this is a humongous change. And policy is as much about process as content. Okay? It's one of the things I had to learn really early on. As an economist, I wanted to focus on content. Process matters just as much. Okay? This is a very different philosophical point of view. Now, why would the House take this position? I don't know. Okay? I'm not, I'm not going to tell, tell you that I do know. They have never quite ever explained why they did this. Okay? You can tell the story, and that's what I'm doing, that it is becoming increasingly harder to get farm bills through the House. And if that's true, and you believe you're not going to get the next farm bill through, maybe you just ought to make it permanent, what you can get this time. Okay? Now, if we were to go down the House route, and I don't honestly think we will, but we could, okay, that changes the whole discussion of this farm bill. Okay? Because whether what drives the farm bill is the reauthorization of Title I. We talk about conservation programs because they're part of the Farm Bill, which we're reauthorizing because we have to reauthorize Title I. We talk about energy programs because they're part of the Farm Bill, which we have to do because we're reauthorizing Title I. Okay? All of these issues get discussed because of Title I, not the other way around. Okay? And so if we go down the House route and they decide to go permanent law, and I would think this is one of the first decisions they would want to make, if I'm an actor in this farm bill then, and pardon my language, you want to make very sure that you get what you want in the discussion. Because you do not know if you're going to reopen this farm bill. Okay? And what that then does is that makes it much harder to compromise. Because I may be willing to give you this because I believe in four years we're going to reopen this up and I'm going, I'm going to get what I want in four years. Okay, this is huge difference. This is a philosophical difference. You either have permanent law or you don't have permanent law. There is no in between. Okay, these are hard to compromise. Okay, dairy programs differ. Uh, they agree. This is very similar when we talk about dairy programs. I'm not a dairy policy expert in any sense of the word but because it really gives you a feel for how these bills suddenly become contentious when they appear to be very similar. Both the House and the Senate bill revoked existing dairy programs and replaced them with a dairy margin program, okay, which is an insurance type program that pays the producer based on the difference between the price of milk and the price of feed. That's why it's called a dairy margin. The margins, the milk cost ratio, differential, okay? Both of them do that. 
But they had two differences that are very significant. One is to control the cost of this program, because this program can get really expensive really fast if the margin starts to collapse. The Senate puts in a supply control program. The House does not have a supply control program. Okay? Furthermore, the, supp the supply control program was in the House bill that came out of the committee. It got stripped on the floor. For many legislators, including Speaker Boehner, dairy policy is a big, big issue. And Speaker Boehner does not like supply control. And the last time I checked, he's a pretty powerful member of the House. Okay. The second difference is there's a subsidy associated with this because you can buy on additional margin in, in addition to the base margin that the government provides free. Okay. The question is, what's the subsidy by size of dairy herd? Okay. And the House and Senate take very different approaches to the structure of the subsidy level. The subsidy level for dairy in the Senate is more favorable to large dairy producers. The subsidy level in the House is more favorable to small dairy producers. And even though I'm not an expert in dairy policy, in any sense of the word, there is a big schism between small dairies and big dairies. Okay? And there is a big cost of production differential. I mean huge, in the order of one-third difference in the cost of production between large and small dairies. So again, this gets really hard because you're asking a philosophical question, how much should you subsidize large producers? Okay? And this is an issue that I will come back to, and again, because this is an issue that keeps coming up. They both bills shift the farm safety net towards crop insurance. Okay? They spend more money on crop insurance, even despite the fact that CBO scores crop insurance at $7.9 billion a year in expenditures for the next 10 years. Okay? And I'll come back to spending on crop insurance. Both the House and the Senate shift the safety net away from Title I. They don't do away with Title I, but shift the safety net from Title I programs to crop insurance programs. But they differ in two really big areas. Okay? The first they differ on is conservation compliance. Many of you may be aware that right now, um, you do not have to comply with conservation compliance to, a, to a avail yourself of the subsidies for crop insurance. So this is not about whether you have access to crop insurance. This is whether you have access to the subsidy for crop insurance. Okay? In case you may not be aware, uh, and many of you I know are, the subsidy levels vary by type of product, by coverage level, yada, yada, yada. Okay? But the average subsidy level is 62%. So on average, farmers are paying 38% of the cost of crop insurance. Okay? By anybody's definition, that is a large subsidy. Okay? Or as many of my non-farm friends will tell me, I would sure like to be able to buy my insurance at 38% of the cost of my insurance. Okay? So for many in the conservation arena, and for many senators and representatives, period, it only seems fair that if we're going to subsidize your purchase of insurance by that amount, we should at least require you to be environmentally friendly. Okay? And that's the way it's put. Okay? Um, now, complicating this whole thing are two other aspects. Uh, not only did the House not pass this, the House leadership has made it very clear they really don't want this on top of it. This is a big issue with them, at least the House Ag leadership. Okay? The other thing is, is that we make substantive cuts in the conservation programs. Okay? I forget the exact number, but it's in the order of 2 to $4 billion over 10 years. Pretty significant cuts in, in conservation programs. And so many in the environmental community are saying, you know, we can live with these cuts, but we want something in return. And what we would want in return is that we would want assurances that people who get crop insurance subsidies, in fact, are benefiting the environment. Okay? So we'll take these cuts. So one of the really interesting questions becomes, let's say that the conf conferees decide they're not going to apply compliance, 
to the bill, then what does that do to the willingness of the conservation community to take the cuts in the conservation programs? All of these things come together. Okay? And it may be that, the, that it comes down to we'll let you have the avoidance of compliance. We won't impose compliance, but you're going to come up with a billion dollars in savings in crop insurance to offset the billion dollars that we're going to put back into conservation because of that. These are the kind of trade-offs that come up. Okay? So compliance is critically tied into the budget in my mind. Okay? The other one is we're back to this size limit. Okay? Uh, among many non-farmers, the size of the insurance program makes them really antsy, and I will talk about why they are antsy about this, okay? Or mad, depending on which one you're talking to. Okay? Um, and what really gets them is that large farmers receive this 62% subsidy. Okay? Now, you need to remember where this is coming from, okay? I'm not, I'm not speaking in support of this. I'm trying to explain why these questions come up. When farm programs were begun in the 1930s, they were begun as poverty programs. Okay, in 1933, the first year that we have information, the per capita income of the farm population was one-third of the per capita income of the non-farm population. Remember, this is 1933 in the midst of a depression. You have 20% of the population with one-third of the income of the, of the rest of the population, if you're trying to move the country out of a depression, that's a good program, a good area to target. So in the historical lineage, farm programs are poverty programs. Just like Social Security is a poverty program. You may not think about it, but the greatest incidence of poverty when Social Security began was in the aged. And what Social Security is, is an anti-poverty program, and it's been an incredibly successful anti-poverty program. Okay? There are relatively few elder Americans anymore who are at least in poverty because of Social Security. Okay? Now, we have had payment limits in farm programs for a long time. We can all talk about whether we actually take them seriously or not. You know, we, we pass payment limits and we pass all kinds of ways that you can get around the payment limits. Okay, but payment limits are a big thing to lots of people. And there has been a real push to put payment limits on crop insurance payments. That you would only have, be able to get $100,000 from crop insurance. Well, that's not good in my mind. And I've said this publicly many times. Okay, because crop insurance is an after the fact program. It's not a before the fact program. It's an after the fact program. Crop insurance can make humongous payments. Okay, but if assuming the program is fair and actuarially ran sound, they're because you've suffered a loss. Okay, so to suddenly cut off payments when a situation has arisen in which payments are in fact desirable strikes me as strange policy. Okay? Now, what I and other people have argued and what the Senate did was they said, okay, what we'll do is if you're a large producer, we'll cut the subsidy level that you receive. Okay? And so adjusted gross, if your adjusted gross income is over $750,000, by the way, do not assume you know what adjusted gross income is until you know what adjusted gross income is. Okay, it's very specifically defined as closer to net income, not gross income. Okay, but at $750,000, your subsidy would decrease by 15 percentage points. So if I buy 75% enterprise insurance, my subsidy rate is 80% right if I had an AGI over 750000 under the Senate provision, my subsidy would drop to 65%, not 80%. Okay? So they're attempting to differentiate size and the subsidy level. And that's a far better approach. I'm not saying whether it's a good approach or a bad approach. That's for you to decide. Okay? But it's a far better approach because it's done before the fact, not after the fact. Because I know, when I know something before the fact, I can make adjustments in my operation. Okay? It's hard to make adjustments after the fact. 
because then you know what you should have done, but you didn't know what you know, so you couldn't have done it. And that's a tough thing to manage. Okay? So whether you like this or not, this, in my opinion, is infinitely better than putting payment limits on crop returns. Okay, well, the other thing you need to understand is the Senate Ag Committee bill did not include this. Neither the 212 bill nor the 213 bill. In both cases, by a vote of approximately 70 to 30, the Senate floor went against the Senate committee and imposed this. Okay? And unlike the House, where there are real differences between the body that's called the House and the, and the House Ag Committee, there's not a lot of differences between the Senate and the body called the Senate, the Senate Ag Committee and the body called the Senate. So this is a big deal, the fact that the Senate went against the Ag Committee and imposed this by not an insignificant amount, a 70 to 30 vote. Okay? What this therefore means is if conference says we're not going to, we're not going to adopt this differential subsidy by size, the Senate conferees are going to have to go back to their respective caucuses and have a really good story to tell why this wasn't adopted. Okay. Not saying, I'm not saying it has to be there, but you've got to, you've got to get something in return. Okay. Because this is what your members clearly indicated to you that they wanted. Okay. So, um, so while crop insurance looks an awful lot similar in the two bills, just like the bill in total, when you get down to where the differences are, you say, hmm, this might be a little hard to conference. Okay? And then finally, the crop safety net. And while most people think the nutrition programs are the reason we may not conference this bill, I actually think it's the crop safety net provisions that will keep us from conferencing this bill if we don't get it conferenced. Again, these bills look very similar on Title I until you delve into them, and they differ on the philosophy of the approach to farm programs. Okay? They differ on at least four different elements. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on any of these. Okay, I'm just going to try to put them together and explain that the Senate and the House really are coming at Title I from a very different perspective. Okay. First of all, the House bill takes the very traditional policy approach of fixing targets on prices okay, for the length of the farm bill. Okay. Uh, and they, the, the Senate takes a very different approach. It goes after revenue on a much smaller proportion of production, and it moves the target. Okay. Now, to try to give you some sense of why this matters and why this is so important, okay, remember that, if, for those of you who are old enough to remember, before 1996 Farm Bill, we had a thing called acreage set-asides. So, so the Secretary of Agriculture was given the authority to actually require you to set land aside if you were a producer in order to have access to the programs. Okay? Why this matters is, and for those of you who know me, you're not going to be surprised at this, you cannot predict prices. Okay? And it shouldn't come as any surprise that Congress can't predict prices. Okay? So if you're going to fix a target price, okay, you've got to expect that either you're going to have it so low that it does no good, or you're going to have it so high that it affects people's production decisions. It interferes with the market. Okay. Well, if you have set-asides, you get it wrong. Okay, big deal. Let's say we get the rice target price too high and we're planting all kinds of acres of rice. You just ratchet up the set-aside on rice. You say, okay, if you want to plant rice, you've got to set 20% set-aside. You just drag it back into equilibrium. The next farm bill, you come back in, you address it by cutting the target price for rice. Okay? So you've got just a mechanism. We don't have set-asides anymore. And remember, the House makes its bill permanent. So if it gets target prices wrong, we have no adjustment mechanism. And they could be out of whack for a long time. Okay? To give you some feel for this, I put together this chart. Okay. One thing you need to understand, target prices are out. Okay? I don't know why, okay? but target prices have acquired a negative connotation. So in policy, whenever something acquires a negative connotation, but you like the concept, you simply just keep the concept and change the name. 
ok so target prices are out the word reference prices and it's in both the house and the senate so strike the word target price from your vocabulary and substitute the word reference price in. ok if you take the house reference price ok and the, pro the program is called the price loss program that's why the word price loss is there and you ratio that to the market price for the last five years from 2008 to 2012 what you see is what the house has done is they have differentially set target prices relative to the market. Okay? Or reference prices relative to the market. Okay? Uh, if we take the average peanut price for the last five years and we look at the reference price for peanuts, it's 100% of the reference price. Okay? Rice is 95%, barley is 96%, so very close to what the price has been the last five years. Okay? If you go down to corn and soybeans, the reference price is set at approximately 70% of the price for the last five years. Okay? One of the best price forecasts is what prices have recently been. Okay? So what this suggests to every economist that I know is that particularly if prices stagnate or decline, we're going to have a lot of incentive to plant peanuts, barley, and rice in this country. Okay? On top of this, this, the house pays on planted acres. It doesn't pay on historical base acres. It pays on what you decide to produce, not what you have produced. So if you suddenly decided to produce a million acres of rice, not that anybody's ever going to do that, but if anybody could decide to produce a million acres of rice, that would immediately be open to the rice target price because it's paid on planted acres irrespective of whether you have paid it in the past. What that does is that really makes this sensitive to are these prices out of line. Okay? The corn and soybean associations are extremely worried about this. Because what they see is real incentives not to plant corn and soybeans. Okay? And remember what commodity organizations care about is their commodity. And therefore how much is being produced. Okay? Now, what I like about moving is that you're saying if you move it with the market, then that takes care of this adjustment process. Okay, because it just follows the market, up or down. Okay? So this is a very major philosophical difference between the Senate and House. And again, you either move them or you don't move them. There's no in between. Okay, and so somebody's going to have to give either the House or the Senate, and the House appears to be really intransient about moving to moving targets, OK? Uh, all right, I talked about base and planted acres. And then finally, the Senate takes a very different approach than the 2008 Farm Bill. It does not allow choice among producers. You have access to both the revenue program and the price support program. OK, you don't get to choose. The House allows you to choose. Philosophically, what the Senate is asking is, given that risk management decisions are inherently difficult, and given that we are asking you to make a one-time decision for five years that could easily turn out to be wrong, isn't the better approach for government to simply say, this is the program that you have, and then let the private market find ways to augment that program? The House is saying, no, we know better what's best for you. We're going to give you those two choices, and you're going to make them, and it's a one-year, one-time only decision for five years. Again, this is a philosophical difference. Should you have one program or several programs with choices? Okay? When I look at these four differences in the crop safety net, I see real difficulty in conferencing this bill. I'm not saying it can't happen. Okay? But you're going to have to trade things off. You're going to have to, somebody's going to win the moving, somebody's going to win the price versus revenue, somebody's going to win the choice, somebody's going to win the base versus historical acres. Okay? And the question is whether the bodies in the House and the Senate will be willing to take only a partial win on each of those issues. Okay? So, now, what does this all say about where we go from here with this farm bill? Okay, um, my honest feeling is that we have at, we probably have a 50-50 chance of getting a new farm bill. 
Okay. Uh, we could get a conference agreement that is an act in law. Okay. Let me just explain to you why I think it's not 50-50. And I'll just, I'll just use nutrition programs here because it's easier to follow the, the line of the argument. Okay. Uh, the Senate is on record, the Senate leadership in particular, but the Senate in general is on record of saying we will not accept a farm bill that does not have anything above a modest cuts in nutrition programs. Of course, the immediate question is, what does modest mean? Okay, I think it probably means cuts that won't exceed double digits. Okay, the House is the House Republican leadership or the House Republican majority, excuse me, is on record of saying we will not accept anything that doesn't exceed. 35 billion dollars to 40 million dollars in cuts. Okay. The president has said he will veto any bill that has more than a modest amount of cuts. So even if by some chance the Senate would give, the president has said he would veto, I highly doubt that that veto would not be sustained, at least in the Senate. Okay. So what this tells me is if we're going to get a food, if we're going to get a farm bill, you're going to have to have a nutrition program that looks an awful lot like the Senate version and not the House version. So that immediately raises the question of, well, how does such a bill get through the Senate, get through the House? Okay, we know how it gets through the Senate. Okay, but how does it get through the, the House? Okay, well, three things have to happen for that to happen. The first is that the conferees in the House have to agree to accept the conference report. Okay. Again, it's not the conference committee that has to accept it. It is the conferees of the House that have to accept it. The conferees of the House have a majority of Republicans. If you look at the political leaning of those Republicans, they tend to be very conservative. Okay. It is difficult, not impossible, to see the conferees of the House accepting a conference bill that has only, let's just say, $9 billion in cuts in nutrition programs. Again, I'm not saying it can't happen. I'm saying it is difficult to happen. Okay? So the conferees of the House, let's just assume the conferees of the House see their way to passing the conference report. Then the Republican leadership has to decide that they're going to allow the bill to come to a vote. Okay. Bills come out of conference and they just die because they're not brought to vote. Okay? The House runs under Robert's Rules of Order. For those of you who remember 4-H or FFA and you know Robert's Rules of Order, the leadership, the power of leadership is that you get to decide what is voted on and when it is voted on. Okay? So the question would become, even if this thing got out of conference, would the Republican leadership, specifically probably Speaker Boehner, and Majority Leader Cantor allow the bill to even come to a vote? Okay? I don't know the answer to that. Okay? Uh, by the way, the Senate works on very different rules. The Senate works on consensus rules, not on Robert's Rules of Order. Okay? It's one of the reasons most people have, do not understand the Senate at all, because they try to imply Robert's Rules of Order. Okay? And if you've never worked under consensus, it's a very different mechanism than working under Robert's Rules of Order. Okay? The House and the Senate are very, very different legislative bodies. Okay? And you can't bring the same mindset to understanding that. So let's just say that, Rep that Speaker Boehner and Majority Leader Cantor allow the bill to come to a vote on the floor. Okay? They would only, they would have to then say, that we're going to allow this to pass with roughly this majority, almost all Democrats plus 50 Republicans. So could you get enough Democrats and 50 Republicans to pass such a bill? So there are three interrelated questions, all of which have uncertainty about them, even just if you look at the nutrition title, irrespective of other titles. So that obviously raises the question, what do we do if we don't get a conference report that can be voted on on the respective floors? Okay. So let's just say the conference committee doesn't reach agreement, and then what we do is we extend the farm bill. 
Okay? I really think if we do it, this will not happen. It will be this one. We will extend it for two years, not one year. Why would we extend it for two years? Because if you extend it for one year, you're going to be back in this whole discussion right in the middle of congressional legislative uh, elections. And why would you want to subject yourself to that? Okay? I'm not saying they wouldn't do it. Don't get me wrong. Okay? I'm just saying I'm not sure that they would want to subject themselves to that. I would not want to subject myself to that as a legislator. So I would go for a two-year extension. However, I think to get a two-year extension, you're going to have to cut something out of farm programs. Okay? And you have to do this because of the budget deficit. You have to do this for the Republicans in the House. And my guess is, is that we would cut direct payments. Okay? Not eliminate, but cut direct payments. My guess is, and I'm just pulling the number out in a sense, but that we already are cutting direct payments by 8.5% this year under sequestration rules. Okay? So that becomes the bare minimum cut that you would do in this situation. My guess is, is that the cut would have to be at least twice as large as that, probably three times, maybe four times as large. I just like the number 25%. It's a nice round number. It's a meaningful cut. Okay? So it passes the smell test, so to speak. Okay? Uh, also, there's a little provision. I love reading bills because there's all these little things that get stuck in there that just kind of make you smile. Okay? The cotton producers actually end up getting direct payments for two years at 75% of current rates. And you would be shocked how many times those kind of little side provisions end up becoming major provisions for the bills in general. Okay? So I think this is version number two of what could happen. Okay? And then finally, for the first time in my 33 years of doing policy, I believe this one's on the table. Okay? I believe we could not conference this bill and Congress decides to walk away from Title I. This is probably, this is not double digits, but it's not zero anymore. This is the first time, in, I'm very serious, the first time in my career where I think there is a non-zero probability that we do away with Title I. Okay? Now, this does not mean that we do not have a safety net. We have crop insurance, but it's a very different safety net. Okay? So, for our just simpler, for our just putting numbers up there because I don't even know that I even trust my own numbers on this. This is probably about, about something like 46%. This is about 46%. This is about 6%. Okay, questions? Thoughts? The revoking a permanent law? Yes. I do not think it will likely pass. Okay? The reason I do not think it will likely pass has to do principally with the non-farm groups, which are really concerned that if we don't, in some way, sense, shape, or sense, sunset Title I, that they will never get their issues discussed. And so I think it's the non-farm community that will argue most vehemently for permanent Okay? Now, clearly, there is a compromise position on this, Marvin. I, I don't know, but you repeal permanent law, okay, and you sunset the Farm Bill or Title I after five years. Okay? This is the one where I can clearly see a compromise position. I have no idea. Okay? Okay? So, I mean, on this one, I can see the compromise. from baseline levels, okay? Um, and what we mean by baseline is if the programs continued for 10 years as currently specified in law, they would, they would cost this much, okay? In many cases, farm programs, these are actual cuts. These are not uh, because there's not an inflation factor that's built into them. I'm not saying that's true in all cases, but in many cases, these are actual dollar cuts and not just cuts from an increasing baseline. Okay? 
Other questions? Yes, Chris? About 79% is the, is the costed number. No. It, uh, I think it was 70% in the 08 Farm Bill. I think it was like 60% in the 02 Farm Bill, but I could have my numbers. It's been quite a while that it's been a majority of spending, okay, but not, not this high. Yes. In fact, the, the, the House, of course, did this because they passed the Farm Bill without a nutrition program. They then came back and passed a nutrition program, and then they melted the two bills together, which you can do. Okay. They, could, they, they took a vote to combine the two bills. Okay. Um, this is an issue that Chris repeatedly comes up. I continue to say to farm groups that we can do this, okay, uh, but you really want to think about this because particularly with respect to the House, why would the House pass a farm bill without a nutrition program? I mean, by most accounts, you have maybe 50 representatives where farming is a significant economic activity in their district. Last time I counted, 50 is not a majority vote in a 435-member body, okay? So could we do it? Of course we could do it, okay? Uh, I mean, Congress can basically do much of anything it wants to, okay? I think farmers would be the big loser as in that, okay? Because I still think we would talk about conservation programs because there's a big enough non-farm constituency. I think we would talk about energy programs because there's a big enough non-farm constituency. Remember that, remember I talked about farm programs being a poverty program? Remember that right now, farm family household income is 120% of non-farm household income. Remember that commercial farmer household income is approximately 180% of the average non-farm household income. Okay? So what farm programs are doing, and this includes crop insurance, is sending money from the poorest to the wealthiest members of society. That becomes rather hard to start a, ne a negotiation process from. Okay. Other questions, thoughts? Okay, deadlines. Um, I think December 31st is the key deadline here. The reason December, it never was September 30th. I, you know, this is just a bunch of yakky going on. Uh, the reason it's December 31st is because on December 31st, the dairy programs end. And when the dairy programs end, the price support will go back to the 1949 Act, which is some X percent of parity. Nuts and bolts is the support price goes, and I don't even know what it is, somewhere between $15 and $18 a hundred weight right now for milk to somewhere between $35 and $40 a hundred weight for milk. So you would probably triple the price of a gallon of milk, okay? Uh, Congress has indicated repeatedly that it will not allow that to happen, okay? And so I think December 31st, but remember what Congress can always do is extend the current legislation for another two months, four months, six months. Okay, so even that doesn't mean we get a resolution by then, but that's the date that I would target on my calendar and circle as the, as the earliest that we would get a farm bill. Yes. Now, what I'd like to do is spend my last 10 minutes talking about a transition to Matt's presentation, okay? Uh, and I want to talk about this, what we've done to the safety net. Not whether this is good or bad, but what we have done to the safety net and how this dramatically impacts you and dramatically impacts your borrowers, okay? In ways that you may not have thought about, okay? This is the first farm bill that we have ever written where crop insurance is the central safety net program. Okay? If you go back even to the next last farm bill, the 2002 farm bill, we were spending over that 2002 farm bill period approximately $5 billion a year on Title I programs. It's a lot of money. Okay? 
we were paying farmers about $1.6 billion a year out of crop insurance. Okay. All of you are probably used to saying crop insurance is a risk management program. Okay. What it also is is a net payment program. Why is crop insurance a net payment program? Because of the subsidy. Okay. If you look at farmers as a group, they are receiving more from crop insurance than they are paying in. The difference between the premiums that they pay and the indemnities that they receive, that does not mean that an individual farmer receives a payment. But farmers as a group receive a payment. Okay? The only difference between Title I programs and crop insurance is that crop insurance requires you to have a loss to receive a payment. That is the only difference. Okay? It is a net payment program. It affects their income statements. It affects their balance sheets in total. Okay? In 2000, in the last five years, we've been paying under a billion dollars under Title I. We have been paying over $5 billion in net income to farmers from crop insurance. This is not just a risk management program. This is a direct income payment program with a loss caveat. Okay? I've had crop insurance for 11 years as a share rent landowner. Anybody want to guess what my net payment is over 11 years? It is $15. So I have not participated in this $5 billion a year payment. Okay? One of the things that you should do with each of your borrowers is you should make them go back and calculate what they've actually paid into and what they have received from crop insurance. Because most of them have been in it for 10 years. They got a long enough period of time to get an idea. And yes, I know as an economist and as a statistician that you've got to have 50 years of data, but you're going to be dead. Okay? 10 years is not a bad starting point. Okay? So that's the first thing. The second thing is we are asking a fundamentally different question in this farm bill. Not what does crop insurance look like if you have Title I, but what does Title I look like if you have crop insurance? we have flipped the senior and junior partner in the safety net. And I do not think we're going to go back. Crop insurance will be the key. The other thing that happened in the last five years, and I've spent a lot of time talking to crop insurance about this, is crop insurance costs went over a billion dollars a year. This may strike you as fundamentally strange, but a billion dollars a year is rounding error in the federal budget. It's not worth fighting over. Okay? $2.6 trillion a year we spend. Do the math. A billion dollars is round here. But when you get over a billion dollars, suddenly people start saying, hey, that's real money. And they change the questions that you ask. The question isn't now, what can we do with this billion dollars to improve the well-being of the recipients of the program? It is, is there a better way to spend this money? I spent the last five years trying to get crop insurance to start thinking that they're going to have to issue these questions, deal with these questions. Why do large farmers receive large crop insurance payments? Why isn't compliance part of, of a $5 billion a year payment program? Those are legitimate questions. You cannot be the central safety net and avoid the other big questions. Okay? This is the first thing. We're dealing with a fundamentally different farm bill. Okay. The thing to remember also on top of this is crop insurance is not Title I. That's an obvious statement. But crop insurance is not Title I in a particular reason. Title I is about multiple year assistance. Crop insurance is one year and done. You cannot look at your borrower